So uh, you are uh, Dr. Uh, Justin Duncan. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> You're not a doctor? I'm not a doctor. People, people think that. Um, and that, that same question got me into grad school because uh, when after I graduated from Prairie View, um, I was working my family land and I was clearing the land out and this, this, uh, this plant started growing up all over the place. And my goats wouldn't eat it because I was clearing the land with goats and machetes because the soil was too weak for me to really put tractors on it. So this plant started growing up all over the place and my goats would not eat it, but it smelled good. And I knew it was in the mint family, so I would chew on it every once in a while. And so I took it to my, my professors at Prairie View and they told me it was a wild basil. And I was like, yes, yeah, well, <laughs> kind of knew that. And I took it to some folks at Houston Community College. And they told me that it was in the mint family. And I was like, yes, I, I knew that too. And then I took it to some folks at a university called Sam Houston State in Texas. Mm -hmm. They told me it was American Beautyberry. American Beautyberry is a woody perennial. This was a herbaceous annual. So that was wrong. Then um, it was the wrong plant family because it was, uh, Beautyberry is a verbenaceae. And this one was uh, obviously a Lamiaceae, obviously Lamiaceae, because Lamiaceae has square stems and aromatic uh, scents. So, you know, if you're teaching agriculture and you get the species, the genus, and the plant family wrong, maybe you shouldn't teach agriculture. <laughs> so I had a friend over at a, some other uh, university that teaches agriculture in Texas, and... Um, she was like, come here. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be, to, be able to identify it. And I didn't want to go there because that, that school and Prairie View have had, you know, historically bad relationships. Like they came and burned our campus and all that. So anyway, um, I, finally, I finally relented and went over there um, because I wasn't going to be able to figure out what it was at the time. And she introduced me to a lady named Dr. Mary Ketcherson. We were two plant nerds, like talking, <laughs> and it was the most beautiful, flowing conversation I've ever had with another uh, plant person. Different leaves on the same stem. <laughs> right, right. So um, she got to a point, she was like, well, where'd you get your PhD? And I'm like, I don't have that. And so she was like, well, where did you get your master's? I was like, I don't have that either. So she paused. And she was like, please tell me you have a bachelor's degree from somewhere. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, Prairie View. And she was like, oh, well, my boss is from Prairie View. So she took me over to Dr. Don Renchi. And Dr. Don Renchi talked to me for a while. And then he took me over to the crop and soil science uh, department. And they got me en enrolled at grad school okay. because of that that question. Where, wow. Um, uh, about where you know, did you, where did you get your PhD? You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I, I think <clears throat> one of the really interesting things about that is that, to, to me at least, is that you can have a lot of different tools, you know, a machete, you know, or a tractor. You know, <laughs> have a lot of different tools out there, but the most important tool is really your mind. Yeah, your knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you, I think, demonstrated that right there. Um, just for your your curiosity of wanting to understand what this was, mm -hmm. I, I think that people can underestimate the value of that. Yeah. Gonna have to be your own scientist on the on the if you're a farmer. Yeah, yeah, got to be your own scientist. Figure out how to overcome your problems because you know farms always have some sort of problem going on, and that's like right. Uh, that's why right now we've got um, through through well NCAT through. Sarah has a, uh, a cover crop um, um, research project going on where we're teaching farmers to do their own research. Gotcha. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, could, what, what, is there an example of you know the, something that people are doing with that? So it's all a it's all a cover crop study, and it's it's covering Texas, Mississippi. Uh, Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. So we've got producers in all those states. We're looking at different different weed and cover crop combinations and and looking got at it. some some things. Is that more like um some long term cover or is it yeah, more like winter crop overwintering or 
Yeah, I mean, it's looking at seasonal cover crops, looking at seasonal, okay. s- uh, summer cover crops, winter cover crops, looking at different sets of weeds and seeing if we can find some some solid relationships. And that's stemming from a um, an NRCS CIG grant I was involved in uh, when I first got to NCAT. And um, I saw some, some relationships that weren't well supported in the literature. And mm-hmm. so I was like, I need to see this repeated on farms throughout the South so I can make sure that this is a real thing and not just, just you know, a, a rare happenstance. Or a nice idea. <laughs> yeah, or a nice idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what is your current position in NCAT? I'm a sustainable agriculture specialist. Okay. So I, I mainly focus on crop production and crop protection. Like I meet with farmers, <clears throat> I meet with... <clears throat> Excuse me. I meet with farmers. I usually go out to their properties and look and see what um, what issues they've got and how to fix them using. And you gotta forgive me. I'm a I'm an organic purist, so I try to come up with an all organic solution for uh, for them because um, I don't want to spray chemicals on any of my stuff. So that's why we've got this presentation with the farmscaping. Right, right. Which is is, is also interesting. Um, Incat. National Center for Appropriate Technology, mm-hmm. you know, and I think with, which is a really fascinating name, but it's also what's appropriate in this scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so it's appropriate technology based on um, that book, Small is Beautiful. I don't know if you've heard mm-hmm. of that, but um, so in when NCAT first came around, um, back in the seventies, they were doing like, you know, appropriate technology type stuff. But in the eighties after farm aid, they kind of switched gears and they were looking at more agricultural, uh, focused, uh, um, topics. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so, uh, we are doing this presentation part of a, uh, I'm David Watkins with Up in Farms, and uh, we're we're doing this work with uh, the Piney Woods School, and uh, through an NRCS grant, and um, you know a series of workshops that we're putting out here. And this one, this big topic here, is um, really uh, about pest management and control, and thinking about that, understanding that. Uh, and you had this great presentation on farmscaping uh, as an approach to general, um, I guess, uh, pest, weed, disease management, thinking of that. It, can you, you know, start by just telling us a little bit about that? Where does that term farmscaping come from? You know, I'm, I had met a guy and he goes by Dr. McBug uh, <laughs> out and he he came to Prairie View. <clears throat> he came to Prairie View some years back uh, while I was greenhouse manager there. And he uh, he did a presentation about farmscaping. And so, like later on, when I was at NCAT, uh, NCAT has a whole publication about farmscaping. So I'm not sure exactly where the name came from. It's just a practice that um, incorporates e- ecology into farming. So it it looks at why pests reach outbreak levels and tries to stop that beforehand. So it looks at like, you know, you're growing monocrop. Monocrop is, you know, monocrops favor pests, not, um, not the crops. So you, um, why, why is that? Because there's no resistance. There's no resistance to the pest spreading. So whatever condition is causing the, the crops to be stressed and attract the insects to attack them in the first place, that's probably, you know, the same throughout the field or throughout much of the field. And so once the pests settle in and they start reproducing, there's no resistance because everything is the same. So they're by their food source. They don't have to travel very far. They don't have to work hard to find food because it's, it's all right there in this monocrop. Whereas in if you had done like companion planting or intercropping, there'd be a little bit of uh, resistance in there because you wouldn't have all the same plants attracting the, uh, the pests. Some of them would be, you know, something that they would have to skip over because that's not their food source. So they would have mm. to work just a little bit harder, a little bit harder 
um, in that in that scenario. So but, diversity just in itself <clears throat> can add some distance and some yes. space and you know an obstacle course right for them that right, can slow right. down their degrading of the plants right. And then if you add that with the, the companion planting uh, aspect of it, the companion plants are there to repel the pests. So they're they're releasing their chemicals and the pests are like, eh, I, don't, I don't see that as food. Let me keep moving on. And so that's that's another issue. Like, so you've got all sorts of concepts like kind of coming together. But when you add the farmscaping into it, which is really adding a place for the insects, for the beneficial insects, specifically for the beneficial insects to start building up so that they can um, they can attack the pests. That's that's what farmscaping is using, using um, using other plants that attract the beneficial insects um, to give them, you know, a feeding site, give them a breeding site, uh, give them an overwintering site, an alternate uh, food site, whatever that can, whatever that farmscaping um, plant that you're planting, in relation to what uh, insect or what uh, beneficial insect you want to attract. Like I was talking about yesterday on the, on the presentation about how fennel attracts many different types of beneficial insects. Hmm. And, um, you know, you can, you can plant a little bit of fennel and fennel is a crop, you know, it's, right, not, it's, right. it's not just, um, a companion plant. It's also a crop itself. So that's a, that's a win-win on everybody's part. So, it's beneficial for um, the crop, the, the, let's say the cash crop that you're trying to produce, or the the farm as a whole, the the area as a whole. But it's not really beneficial to to the pest, <laughs> right? No, it's a, it's not... a, you're introducing a natural <laughs> predator for these pests. Is that right? Right, right. And so the the predators, they just they need a place to to hang their hat, and so that's what the that's what the farmscaping. Um, plantings do and you don't have to have like a whole big block of farmscape and stuff you can have little strips or little patches or whatever th interspersed throughout the field to give um, the beneficial uh, insects a refuge in fact that's another name for it is a refugia uh, uh, wow I've never heard that term uh, uh, so you give the beneficial insects a, a refuge so that they can um, they can help take care of your crops gotcha so just as those just as those um pests they're going to come in and they're going to eat eat your crops because that's naturally what they do there are other organisms out there that naturally prey upon those pests right and right. you want to introduce other crops that will attract those pests those uh the predators. beneficial predators yeah. right right okay and, and so i mean even even backing up from there because you know I, I want to understand why the pests are there in the first place. And mm. um, a lot of what I've seen and read and, and dealt with is it, it leans back to the point that uh, pests are, are, are attracted to stressed plants. And that stress can, can come from like water stress as in the drought. It could be uh, heat stress. It could be um, it, it's missing... Uh, minerals. It's missing uh, micronutrients and trace elements in the soil. Um, it's it's the wrong soil for it. The wrong drainage. A wrong organic. A wrong amount of organic matter. Um, so any 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 little thing. Because we we as humans we decide, and um, a lot of us, a lot of new farmers, have this romanticized view of farming where they they see a patch of land and instead of coming to an understanding of what potential that land has they just plant their stuff and they're like i'm gonna make this grow here but they've kind of like forgotten that mother nature is out there mm -hmm. and she has some certain demands of all this all this all this living material that we're dealing with it has its own requirements. So if you go out and plant something in some droughty soil that um, that needs a bit more organic matter content, 
and maybe it needs a needs more of an organic matter content because it's got a certain mycorrhiza that it deals with, like blueberries. So mm. if you go out and plant a bunch of blueberries somewhere and it's the wrong soil, those blueberries are, are going to suffer and then they're going to become pesky. They're going to get full of pests because they're in the wrong soil. They don't have the right, right mycorrhiza <coughs> to keep them healthy. And so now they're, they're stressed, they're suffering, and the, and the pests are going to come. Because the mm. pests have no, no choice. They want food, and they're smelling this plant over here. And this, this plant smells like it's food now because it's stressed. And so they go and swarm it. And, you know, there's there's a lot of little nuances out there in these soils. I, I love to go out to a producer's place and walk their, walk their land and see what's growing there naturally. Because whatever's growing there naturally is going to give you an idea, like a guideline of what, what plants can go. You go out there and you see a bunch of uh, members of the rose family, you know you can grow other members of the rose family mm -hmm. and they'll be okay. You might have to tweak a little bit here and there, but you don't have to like break the bank trying to get amendments to fix the soil to make those things grow. Right. And so that's right. what I try to get producers to, um, to understand. Like in Texas, uh, we've got this weed called um, 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 silverleaf nightshade. Wherever you see silverleaf silver leaf nightshade growing, you can grow eggplants. Gotcha. Or any other nightshade. That's... Mm, so it, with or with maybe the, not in the with the nightshades <laughs> with the nightshades it's it's a little it's a little specific for me. Okay. When I see when I see um, the little Chinese lanterns growing. I know I can grow tomatoes because okay. the tomatillos and the tomatoes, they have like the same requirements. But mm. I see if I see the silver leaf nightshade growing, I'm going to grow eggplants or I'm going to grow peppers because those would do better in those soils. It's there's some nuances to it. So gotcha. Some gotcha. things you have to understand. But right. for the most part, like and these things grow in complexes, too, because like if you see like I know if I see blackberries, I can also grow persimmons. For whatever mm -hmm. reason, those two, they grow well in the same soil. Um, and then um, peaches. If I see blackberries growing, I know I can plant peaches there and they'll do well. It, so so part of that, <coughs> what you expressed there too, is you really want to understand what the what your, what's in your soil, what it's got, what it's missing, and what the plants need. Because if you're not working those things in conjunction – you're inviting pests basically because you're going to grow weaker plants yeah. and that weakness is going to send signals out to, to the pests. Hey, I'm available for the taking. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Just like in the example I use in the, in the presentation is just like, it's like sharks in the ocean. Those, those, uh, those sick fish, those weak fish, those hurt fish, the sharks are coming because that's, that's what the sharks know to to hone in on, and they've they've developed to where, okay, there's a sick a sick fish, there's a hurt fish, you know, over that way. Let me go that way. Hmm. Same thing with our insect pests. Wow. They they hone in on these on these weak weakened plants, and they're like, oh, this is a food source. And now now that they get there, now they're overwhelming the plant to the point where the plant you know can die, and so. Um, that's, that's one thing that, that I've learned from growing all these crops all the time. It's like, once those, once those crops get weak like that, I just take them out. I don't right. worry about okay. trying to spend money on them. It's, it's not worth it to me to try to, to fight nature on this. Cause you know, she's, she's bigger than us and she's got deeper pockets and she's a bully. So <laughs> I'm not messing with Mother Nature. Mother Nature says, don't grow that. Well, I'm not going to grow that. I'm going to grow something else that grows better in that spot. Because when you go out in nature, there's something growing there. Wherever you grow, anywhere, or wherever you go, anywhere in the world, just about, um, there's something growing there. And whatever's growing mm -hmm. there is, is a guideline for whatever crops you can grow in that spot. You might have to think differently. Um, don't go out in, in the middle of the desert and be like, I'm going to grow soybeans here because, you know, nothing, and nothing else is growing there. So if nothing else is growing there, take a hint, don't, don't grow there move on. Right. Do something else. So that's, that's really fascinating. Um, 
it, it, so I, when you were talking about that, I was thinking like, like military <laughs> and you have a, a military background as well, right? Cool. Is that, my, that's, my, my family's five generations United States Army. Wow, wow. Well, I was thinking exactly that. If you if you send if you send your troops out there without the right armor, then they can't defend themselves. You know, just kind of naturally. So you run out there without shields, and you know nobody has a shield. People are going to get injured, and then. And then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> you know, they're gonna get overwhelmed in that. I, 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 I can just see that. It's like the, the shark smelling blood. It's like you see that, and they're gonna the swarms are gonna happen. All right, and that's just. I, I mean, that that's the concept that farmers need to understand, because without that, without that deeper understanding of plant stress, they're spending all this money on products to fight the pests when they should have just moved on to something that grows better in that soil. Gotcha. Uh-huh. Gotcha. So that's in, I, I guess within that, there are all kinds of micro climates, micro ecosystems mm-hmm. within oh. a farm, within, within a couple of acres, even, yep. you know, that, um, you know, this area is, this patch is really good, you know, and this one's not, think about something else over here. So it's not just, Oh, you know, 10 acres here it's all going to be the same right right so much diversity that that reminds me of of in in west africa uh west africans had a very deep understanding of rice because they're they domesticated a species of rice on their own which is a rhizoglabarima and they understood that they could grow this variety in this one place, but this next place I would grow this variety and this this type. Wherever wherever there was a microclimate, they knew where to grow rice there. And so Interesting. that's why they got kidnapped and brought over to the States to grow rice. And they were trying to tell people out in South Carolina that this this rice would grow in this spot and this rice would grow every, here and there. But they were just trying to make them grow, you know, like one type of rice or whatever. So uh, that is uh, that is uh, that that is an amazing, uh, h- tragic, horrible story. Mm. But something I think is incredibly fascinating. And that's the first time I've actually ever heard that as well about the the experiential and you know the over the generational buildup of knowledge about how to grow pieces of land you know uh how to uh, cultivate (laughs) food within certain areas by understanding that land yeah people come in here they don't speak the language they don't see that they see the results and they try to take the people somewhere else to say okay replicate that (laughs) do this and it doesn't work you know they destroyed well they grew a lot of rice out there yeah i bet well i bet they did but they they did a lot of destruction in the process yeah you know um that's that's just uh, that's really interesting that's a story for another time i guess (laughs) to 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 dig into that but that's kind of fascinating um you know so uh Part of the presentation, you talk about they're basically these essential principles of farmscaping. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could outline those, you know, and we can. So, where's the? Because um, because that was up on the screen, and he took it off the screen. So. But uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, there are some principles. Um, there's four basic ecological principles. And, you know, I, I stress ecology because, you know, it's not just, it's just not agriculture. It's not just ecology. It's agroecology. We're growing okay. crops in nature, in, within the ecology. Even if, even if you've like, you've, you've, uh, you've totally destroyed the field and and made it like a moonscape and then started planting. You're still dealing with ecology because 
you're you're in that web of life out there. Now, what is ecology again? Ecology is the study of the environment. Okay, it's, it's um, you're looking at you're looking at environmental um, relation relationships to uh, farming, and if we don't understand the ecology of a thing, and like um, like uh, like in my other presentation, I talk about um, I talk about ecological succession. And eco ecological succession is when, you know, the land is at a certain state and it's going to transition to another state. So let, let's say if you have like a, a moonscape blank canvas of, of a piece of land, first the pioneering plants are going to come and they're going to, and these are mostly weeds, these are going to come and take over and build up their population and then they're gonna die and decompose and they're gonna keep on doing that until they build up the soil a bit. And then you're gonna get a like, uh, you know, different brush, or woody perennials, uh, smaller trees, they're gonna come in. And eventually that land is gonna go from this uh, empty empty landscape to a full grown forest. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's the ecological succession. That's where you're trying to get to get to and you're starting off with these bacterially dominant soils and you end up with fungally dominant soils. Uh, and so okay. a lot of our crop plants need to be in fungally dominant soils, but because we're tilling all the time, we're making them bacterial dominant soils. And so that's setting them up for failure in the beginning. And that's why we're having, to, having so much like pesticide and fertilizer and all that other stuff to try to shore up this difference between these bacterially dominant soils and these fungally dominant soils. Gotcha. Wow. So we bring that back to, um, to farmscaping and the four basic e ecological principle or principles, uh, dealing with that. First, you want to increase plant diversity. You want to have more different types of plants. And then, uh, two kind of piggybacks off that. And it says increase plant structural diversity because you don't want, the plants to all be a uniform structure, like let's say that they were all rosette plants, like uh, like lettuce and cabbage. Well, <clears throat> that doesn't give you structural diversity. Structural diversity comes in where you're growing, you know, your lettuce and cabbage, and then you've got some faba beans in there, something else that can grow in the winter time, um, at the same time as the lettuce and cabbage. So now okay. you've got you've got different structures in the field that insects have to. Uh, um, to deal with. And, and that's a totally different concept from thinking about like having a uniform stand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Different, different concept. Right. Right. You don't want that uniformity. If you're looking at it from, um, a farmscaping perspective, you're looking at it from a perspective where you're trying to work with nature to grow these crops instead of working against nature to grow the crops. So the nature that I want to work with is the beneficial insects. I don't want to work with the pests. Mm hmm. So I want to increase that plant structural diversity to give the beneficial insects a food, give them an overwintering site, give them mating sites, give them someplace where they can hang out and do their thing when they're not patrolling your crops for pests. And then you want to increase uh, the time that both of those are available mm. um, because the longer those farmscaping plants are over there, the longer the beneficials can stick around and, and do their job. Then the, lastly, you want to decrease the distance beneficials have to travel because you don't want them putting their energy into flight and, you know, hunting. You want them, well, in flight and, and, and all that, you want them to put their energy into hunting because, you know, if they, just like the pests, if, if they don't have any resistance um, from plant to plant, then they're going to overwhelm everything. If you give the predator plenty prey to feed on in, in a close a close proximity, it doesn't have to travel so far. So it can put mm -hmm. more energy into reproduction, just like the pest would put more energy into reproduction if it doesn't have to travel so far for food. So it's conservation of energy. You want to use less on travel and use more on reproduction for the, right. for the predators. Right. Proximity. Yeah, right. that's, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering about the practical implications of that and how that, uh, you know, on the, 
So it does mean you really want to do a lot more intercropping, you know, and you right. want to you want to invite. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned companion crops. Where do you put a companion crop? You know, is it are these you know companions that wave each other you know as they're passing by and you know across a fence or are they like always holding hands? So how how does that work? I mean, they can be they can be in the next row. They could be like several rows over. They can be within the row. I mean, it just depends mm. on on your planning scheme and and how you can harvest and all that. But I do want to stress that the farmscaping thing is great. But I think even more important than that is crop selection in the beginning. Trying to figure out what you can grow that's not going to have any of these issues. Gotcha. Because if you go out in nature, you don't see a lot of issues in these in the wild plants and the in the weeds and the in the environment they're just growing out there doing their thing very rarely you'll see a bunch of pests just loaded up on a plant out there in the wilds so you'll find a pest here and there but you just don't see except for aphids and they're going to build up you know certain times of the year until the lady beetles and other insects figure out to go get them but even the aphids they They'll bloom for a little while. They'll they'll have uh, population blooms and then they fade out. So you just mm. don't see that in nature. So you that's why I tell nature. farmers to emulate nature, figure out how to grow in accordance to nature, Cro pick the right crops for your soil. Farmscaping is like it's like that stop a stopgap measure. It's like um, I've I've got these pests that I'm dealing with because I'm growing these crops. And I haven't figured out yet that these might not be the best crops for me, but I'm gonna grow these. Uh, I'm gonna grow these farmscaping plants so I can attract the the beneficial insects to deal with those pests. So. so I guess one of the questions that comes to mind for me is that, so when you're thinking about, um, can you still get a lot of overall crop diversity within a, within a region, you know, so that you're not just growing. You know, the same five or six kind of crops, you know, with it within an area, uh, but you might be able to grow a lot more things that can you know, provide a diversity of food for people. Oh, yeah, because I, I mean, it goes back to looking at nature. It, nature doesn't have that problem. OK, there's, there's dozens and dozens of different species out there growing somewhere. So wherever you're at, there was, you know, a, a natural complement of of plants, even even in the prairies, mm. we think that the prairies are just grasses, but there's a bunch of wildflowers and all sorts of stuff growing out in those prairies too. They don't have to be committed just to grass. Okay. Okay. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what are some of the um, other tenets of uh, farmscaping that we really need to kind of understand and appreciate? So um, one thing... One thing that that helps you with farmscaping is knowing whether you've you've achieved it or not. And so if you know that you've you know actually achieved some farmscaping when you sample a quarter to a third of the plants and they show evidence of the beneficial insects, you know they'll they'll have like um, the beneficial insect itself, like a like the wasps or the beetles or or It'll have their larvae, their cocoons, uh, their pupa, uh, mummies of, uh, of aphids or, you know, the, the beneficial insect eggs, like we saw with the lacewing uh, fly eggs. Mm -hmm. So you want one quarter to a third of your plants out there in the field to have the beneficial insects. That's when you know you've actually achieved farmscaping. A, th a, th a third to a quarter or a quarter to a third. Yeah, a quarter to a third quarter to a third. Wow. So how do you, you know, how are you testing that? Well, you'd go out and scout your field. You go and walk and, and you, you'd examine uh, one plant and the next plant, the next plant, the next plant to see if one of those plants at least had, had a beneficial insect um, telltale sign there. All right. So, so what, I, what I'm inferring from that is you got to kind of know the difference between these insects. Yeah, yeah, you that, really, you really got to know that's <laughs> what it is. Because I go out there, I say, "Oh, it, it's a bug," <laughs> and when I killed all the bugs, get all these bugs off this stuff. Yeah, but some yeah. of them, yeah, you know, they're not, they're not out there harming. 
you know, the, those plants. Right, 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 right. Yeah, there was a great picture uh, in your presentation about um, it had uh, when it had all the the wasp eggs on it. On the leaf? Oh yeah, no, it wasn't a leaf. It was on a, uh, it was on a caterpillar. On a caterpillar, yeah. right? Okay, and you see all those, and immediately I'm thinking that's gonna be. If I saw that near a crop or anything like that, that'd be terrible. Things you want to destroy. No, you leave that caterpillar alone because that caterpillar is covered in beneficial insects, and once they hatch out of there, they're gonna go and hunt other uh, caterpillars. So gotcha, oh. gotcha. All right, so. One of the things that I, I thought that was probably the most interesting thing that, for me, for my for my experience, my understanding was uh, the focus on um, the the greenhouse or high tunnel growing um, and and pest management within that. Um, the things that the some of the issues that just kind of kind of rise by growing in a greenhouse. Uh, and then ways of um, doing some pest management and inviting change. Basically, how, how do you manage the ecology within that? So a, a lot of a lot of what's going on in the greenhouses is, you know, greenhouses are a great place for pests to grow because they, they don't have the natural enemies present. They, they don't have any resistance whatsoever to their to their reproduction. And so once pests like white flies or aphids or mealybugs get in the greenhouse, they just they just start throwing parties. <laughs> but the worst one is uh, to me is spider mites because spider mites build up so rapidly and you know they're they're controllable in that you have to look at your cultural conditions because mm -hmm. your cultural conditions are what are, are what's causing spider mites to build up so rapidly because you know a lot of greenhouses and especially in the summertime they get hot and dry and those are the those are the conditions that that favor spider mites so once it's hot and dry in there they just go on this um on this uh on this uh reproduction fast forward and they just can take over and you'll have so many spider mites in there that you know it's just overwhelming everything so since the spider mites like it hot and dry, if you have the the ability to uh, turn the temperature down in the greenhouse, make it make it cooler, and then mist it, you know, put the fog machines out, get as much humidity in the air as you possibly can, because spider mites don't like cool and dry conditions. Hmm. But since we know this, as a greenhouse manager, you know that if the greenhouse gets hot and dry, spider mites are gonna uh, come wipe out everything. Just keep it cool and moist in there from the beginning. Don't ever let it, the conditions favor the pests. And, um, you know, since like, like aphids, aphids, their natural, one of their most natural enemies is, um, is rain. Because the raindrops, you know, they, they hit the aphids and while the aphids are feeding, it breaks off their proboscis, their, their little mouth. It breaks that off. And then the raindrops are so big to compared to an aphid, they drown them, they crush them, they smash them up. Wow. And so it doesn't rain inside of greenhouses. So there's... So you lost a, a natural deterrent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, the aphids are able to, to build up in that. And so, you know, you just you can take your your uh, your your spray head and turn it to shower and you know spray the aphids for you know five minutes or whatever that takes a long time but you know some people just rather spray something but i would much rather have some lady beetles or some lacewing flies in in there eating all that stuff okay. because they can reach where i can't reach and they'll keep the population uh down so you do go ahead. So, so do you introduce those um, independently, or do you introduce those with a to another plant? Uh, what what I used to do is I would catch them out in the field, and I would just you know uh, put them in the greenhouse. Some of them some of them work better in greenhouses than others because uh, a lot of insects they have a tendency to just fly up and 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 die up at the top of the greenhouse somewhere. But sometimes uh, the lady beetles they would take and they would they would feed where they needed to feed. But most likely, if if it gets to that point, I'm taking whatever plant 
that is infested, I'm taking that out and, and you know, taking care of it outside um, and not spreading the aphids around. You know, you got to be fastidious. You got to be clean. You got right, to right. pay attention to these things. And, and so you really have to you really have to know what it is that you're looking for and what you're looking at. Right, 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 right. I guess those are two different things. One is what should you be seeing here? Mm -hmm. And then if you're seeing something, what do you do about it? All right. And those things come through experience. They, they come from actually, you know, doing the thing in real time and all that. Learning from someone who's more experienced is, is helpful. Um, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there and all that. And... You know, some are hit or miss, some are okay. Um, people just trying to make a buck or whatever, you know, putting, putting these videos out. So I, I think what one of our goals here is to um, uh, infect people's minds <laughs> right now with, uh, with, 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 uh, with some uh, curiosity uh, and, and the realization that there, there are tools available for them. Uh, and um, to give them an, enough exposure to this, obviously, from somebody um, sitting through this presentation, understanding it, it, just just watching it, they're they're not going to immediately have the knowledge to go out and do everything. They'll walk away with a lot, but uh, I think this would be a great you know, way to be able to invite you to a, to come to their farm or to to work within a group you know setting and do things that are more kind of hands-on and show them these are the kinds of bugs we're talking about this is what this looks like these are where these are this is how you identify that you know to help them with some of that experience uh because yeah I, th these are not things that you can just grab through a a, a single video or single sitting yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the key concept with farmscaping, you know, since it's a proactive thing is you want, you want to think ahead. And if you're going to, if you usually have a pest, then plant something that will attract the, uh, the predators of that pest. So, I mean, just keep plenty of flowers out there. You plant vegetables, plant the flowers next to them, you know, plant the flowers within them. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt your broccoli. If you plant some, um, some clover around it or, or something that's going to bring some flowers, um, it's, it's not going to hurt it. So, you know, why, why not? So if you're doing something like squash, you know, squash or cucumbers, something like this. So with squash and cucumbers, um, if, if they're, uh, if they're the scrambling type, if they're, if they're, you know, vining, um, you're going to want to plant something, you know, that can get over them like corn or okra or something like that. Um, the bush type squash, um, you can plant some basil with them or, you know, some other things that are going to make a make a smell when the squash leaves abrade against the plant to try to push away um, the stink bugs, the, the squash bugs, because mm. they don't like they don't like the aromatic smell. Stink bugs don't like anything that stinks worse than them. Right. <laughs> so you plant aromatic herbs amongst your your uh, plants that uh, usually get uh, infested with stink bugs so that those aromatic herbs can release their aromatics and drive off your your uh, your stink bugs. Things like mint, um, the basil, holy basil, things that have like decent smells. Wow. You mean these, these insects can smell these things too, just like we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Wow. All right. So I guess if you're, if you're really getting started in this, mm -hmm. um, what's a, probably the, if, there, if there's a principal piece of advice you could give to somebody in having a mindset and thinking about things this way, how do you start? What do you do? Well, I mean, if you want to start farmscaping, uh, NCAT uh, through through Atra on, on the website has a publication that is farmscaping. So you can go and, and download the publication and you, you can read through it. And, you know, I will start there because it gives you, you know, all that foundational understanding that you need to, to start this up from the beginning. Okay. Because it's, uh, farmscaping is not reactionary. It's not, oh, I've got pests now, what do I need to do? And so my publication 
um, my publication through Atra is called um, Companion Planting and Botanical Pesticides. Companion planting is a proactive thing because you've planted these crops together and the, um, the, uh, the, the aromatics are driving off the pests or whatever. The botanical pesticides part of it is reactionary. It's like, oh, I've got, I've got this issue. Let me figure out what I can spray on it now. And it talks about how to, how to formulate your own botanical pesticides, use essential oils and, and that sort of thing. So you can figure out your own recipes and go out there and spray for pests that you've, mm. that you've got now. So the companion planting, botanical pesticides, they go hand in hand because we're looking at how to make your own stuff to deal with things now versus, well, you should have done that at the beginning with the companion plants. Right, yeah. right. Okay. That, yeah, I, <clears throat> in the typical farmer, I think is, you know, generally coming from the mindset of even when they're, hey, I'm buying chemical supplies in advance, that's still, it's, even if you're buying that three months before, it's still, it's still a reactive process. Right. You know, right. it's still anticipating things that you're going to react to as opposed to um, you know, managing the ecology better. Right, right. That, that should have been the other, th uh, that should have been the question that the producer was asking when he was buying those pesticides is why do I have these pests in the first place and fix that. Once you understand what's, what plant stress is, is, um, is causing the pest problem, you fix all that. And, you know, my, my thing was, was crop selection pick the right crop for the conditions. Address the problem, not the symptom. Right, right. And so like when, when I was at Prairie View, um, during, the, during the horrific drought back in 2010 and 2011, I still had crops in the ground. Really? Nobody else had crops. I had crops and they were six, seven, eight feet tall with no irrigation, with no fertilization and no spraying for pests. Because I understood what that what that soil could grow in those conditions, and I planted the crops that could grow there, and they flourished. So you have to have that understanding of the limitations and opportunities that nature has given you in this piece of land. There's something that'll grow there wherever you are. There's some there's something that can grow. There. I mean, except for the extremes. So we're not talking about like Antarctica and and stuff like that. We're talking about like you know, normal places where people live, there's something mm. that'll grow in that soil. You just have to figure out what it is. And I think that most farmers, you know, are, are also concerned with, well, how do I do that and make money? <laughs> how do I do that and make a living at this? Right. You know, and that that's marketing. Yeah. You know, that's, that I'm not, I'm not so much a marketer, but I understand that marketing deals with that story that you're telling. You know, people people want to buy something because this is a consumer country. We want to buy stuff. That's that's what we do. But that story behind what you've done is what sells. Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent with that. I think that maybe farmers, uh, with everything else they're responsible for thinking about and managing and doing should um they really should understand the uh nutritional components of the things that they're growing and that is part of the story that they want to be able to tell if they can communicate that mm. to others i think they can grow um things that are more natural to the habitat mm -hmm. you know, and then you know use that to market it in itself um the nutritional component. Here's the story for what we're doing and why this is. Right, right, right. Um, but it's still going to be a challenge. It's always it's always a challenge. Making making money doing this is uh, <laughs> it was a challenge anyway. But if you're growing the same thing that all your neighbors are growing, that's a challenge because you've you've got to compete against them. And I, I'm a firm believer in, a believer in comparative advantage. If they can grow it cheaper than you, by all means, let them grow that cheap thing. And you figure out something expensive that you can grow that is related to those things. So, you know, everybody doesn't have to grow watermelons. You can grow Sharon Tay. You can grow, you can grow bitter, bitter uh, gourds, bitter melons. You could grow something else that's related 
that needs those same requirements as those watermelons and make your money off of it because now you're not mm. growing the same thing that everybody on the same street is you know or same area so what was growing. that first thing you said the, the after the oh charente charente yeah the charente melons are french melons they are bred for eating not shipping a lot of our melons in this country they're bred for shipping they're bred so oh we harvest these and we're going to pack them in a truck and we're going to drive them 2000 miles so when you select for a trait you're selecting for the traits of shipability or transportability or whatever um you're selecting against things like flavor mm -hmm. and so like the french melons they're bred for flavor they're bred for oh this is some good eating yeah so you may not be able to drive them two thousand miles uh in in a you know in the back of a truck for a week in refrigeration or whatever but you can take them to the farmer's market and sell them because they're they're delicious. It, it, you just just raw. You make some. You use them as part of other, you know, uh, in, as ingredients and other things. I mean, use them however you would, you would use a cantaloupe or a honeydew or whatever. It's just a, it's just a melon. So I, I guess I, I guess what I'm thinking is the the more that a farmer understands applications for it, mm -hmm. you know, and and can help communicate that to the buyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you can use this in six different ways. Here's how we use it. Have samples of it. You'll be able to demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. I think that can, um, you know, uh, can help uh, introduce you know, new habits to people and new 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 taste I, I get that but with the charente i just want to i just want uh, charente is a horrible a, example a, it's a, you just taste i just straight. want i just want a fresh uh slice of melon that's so juicy is running down all my arms and all that sort of stuff that that's what i want oh, that sounds pretty good to me right now yeah. too <laughs> yeah i mean well, how how does how does a producer get get you know to that 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 crux between ecology and i'm making money on my land is you know grow grow many different things try some stuff out experiment repeat the experiment a couple of times figure out what really grows for you and concentrate on on those things that grow for you don't don't try to reinvent the wheel and put all these amendments and sprays and chemicals on your stuff just figure out what can grow there naturally and stick to those things when i was a when i was a prairie view mm. what what i stuck to was um, sweet potatoes and strawberries because they did fantastic for me and I didn't have to do too much. They just did well. And so I would rotate uh, cover crops and strawberries and sweet potatoes. And that was that was my thing. And then I had my other experimental crops that I was growing and, and looking at and, um, and all that. But for the most part, like I stuck to those two things and the cover crops because they did well I didn't have to worry about them. I didn't have to put all that extra energy in them. We grew them. We harvested them. We moved on about our business. That, that's that's fascinating. So within that, can you could you just explain that rotation a little bit? Uh, were you like, uh, were you just like going back and forth between the sweet potatoes and the strawberries and the cover crop in between, or were you well, leaving fallow? Or? What what I did is um, I ran two cover crops back to back, and then would plant the um, the the strawberries that that fall and then i would run to cover crops back to back and then come with the sweet potatoes and so i made it so that it, it offset really nicely um we would come directly and see, see sweet potatoes sweet potatoes are cover crop themselves mm. because once the once those vines set out they cover up everything and i actually um was was trying to get some uh some research done about that um but I'll, I'll do that coming up soon. But anyway, um, but yeah, cut, uh, sweet potatoes are excellent cover crop. And so if they're already suppressing the weeds and then you come with two other cover crops and then plant strawberries and the way we plant strawberries is we did, uh, we did the plastic mulch. And so it really knocked back the Bermuda grass, the nutsedge, the Johnson grass, um, the amaranth, you know the things that were weeds in that in that place in that situation mm -hmm. and so we never really gave them a chance to get a foothold again once we were doing that that rotation and you're just talking about the soil structure 
a, a lot of that. The soil structure. Okay, so we. Okay, so the soils I was dealing with, they were <laughs> one of the older guys on the farm. He said, "Boy, you just need to write, write that off as a wetland and <laughs> and grow somewhere else because the soil was terrible when I started out." But I um I put in um I put in cow manure, I put in wood chips, I put in um mushroom compost and I and I built that soil up or I would grow cover crop, cover crop, cover crop until and, and incorporate it in the soil until I got the soil nice and nice and, and great. I also use a reciprocating spader. And that was huh. one of the most important things that I could have done because a lot of people in the United States, they don't know about these reciprocating spaders. They get a disc. I'm in the, I'm in the dark here. <laughs> they get a disc and they get a tiller and they prepare their soil that way and it completely destroys the soil structure. And so I ran an experiment one time. Not, a, not really experiment. I just ran a test. Um, I did, I did a tiller through the field, through, through a row and I did the reciprocating spader through the next row, same soil, same everything. The only difference was one had a tiller, one had the reciprocating spader through it. At the end of the season, you could not, you could not penetrate the soil that had the, that the tiller had gone through, but you could stick your arm into the soil that deep where the reciprocating spader had gone through. Wow. At the end of the season. Wow. No other anything except for that pass with the tiller and that pass with the reciprocating spader. Because the reciprocating spader does not destroy your soil structure. It it pops the soil up and fluffs it up and all that, buries your your bulky material. So if you want to mix uh, manure or uh, or compost into your soil, you use a reciprocating spader and it mixes it very, very well. But it doesn't destroy the soil structure while it's at it. Wow. And so wow. that was an advantage that many people didn't didn't have and don't still don't understand to this day that those those spaders, they're what you want. Okay, so where does somebody get a reciprocating spader? <laughs> <laughs> you have to make one. No, you, you you'd have you've gotta find somebody that can order it for you. Um I know a guy in Texas, uh, Lynn Rimsing at, at Nismer Farm Farm Equipment. He can order them because they're coming from Italy. Okay, they're okay. Italian made. You know, companies like uh, like Falk and Tortella. Um, I think Chelli is another one. They they love them over there, man. They're like, I I promise you, Prairie View. When I, when I left Prairie View, Prairie View had the best soil manipulation equipment in the country wow. because I had wow. two reciprocating spaders. I had a rotary spader. A rotary spader is another, is a, is another beast, man, because it's, it does first and second pass tillage in one pass. It does seedbed preparation because it got a power harrow on it. And then you can put a hot and Bickler seeder on there and you can seed. So four operations, in one pass. Wow. Efficiency. That's pretty great. Yeah. 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 How, how much does something like that um, generally I mean, cost? It costs a lot. It costs a lot. And the guy that you can get the uh, the rotary spaders from is uh, is Nazarok out at Purple Mountain Organics. Because I know okay. he was he was uh, shipping those into the... He was importing those. But... Um, that was another great piece of equipment that we had at Prairie View, and you could plant your cover crops in, you know, one pass. Wow! Wow! Field renovation, seed bed preparation, all one pass. So, I, one one question I have that um, I, I guess this is kind of like a a, a knowledge gap for me, that, and I, maybe other people had the same question. I don't know, but. Um, when you're when you're thinking about how to how to proactively manage your fields and your crops and thinking about this for bringing in the beneficial insects, um, yeah, yeah, how far apart do you need to keep for 
crops that um, don't really support one each other each other well? How much space do you really need? When you say crops that don't support each other well, like they're antagonistic type crops where they're yeah, competing against if each other? If you're thinking of like doing a rotation, mm-hmm. you know, um, how much space do you need between to really make that rotation work? You know, uh, do you need, are you just, oh, we can rotate these rows and these rows, or you need more space between the different soil for the, you know, both, both from a soil perspective and from, uh, a past perspective. All right. When you say when you say rotation, do you mean like is this is this a field level rotation where like I'm taking this field out and I'm rotating to the next group of crops, or are you saying rotating as in you know I'm alternating this row and this row and this row with different crops and so so I'm I because it sounds like you're saying rotation, but it seems like you're you're talking about all alternate crops like like the companion plants yeah well you know what i let's just say i've seen uh, um the the a farm that we were both at recently has a lot of rows and they have a lot of crops on these rows you know um and i'm not sure that they're thinking about uh, i'm not even sure rotation is even really capable within this do you know what i mean there's the Atra publication on um, uh, crop rotations uh, for organic production. Uh-huh. And so they have examples in there of some different farms. And they've got like this field. And then they'll show that they're rotating different crops in this, in this area and then this area. Like year one, we're doing this here and here and here. And year two, we're doing this here and here. So they're doing all those rotations in, in the different kind of I guess what they're calling fields, mm-hmm. but um, how much space do you really need in order to allow those different kind of environments to flourish? You know, I, you, or you break this down into like rows in the same field or blocks or, I mean, how do you, how do you manage? I, and I, I'm asking this because I think that, I think generally, there's a lot of confusion um, by you know about managing the uh, ecology, but managing the um, thinking of it in a, in a proactive way, other than just kind of saying, you know what, here's my squash rows, here's my tomato rows, and my watermelon rows, and I've got you know I've got a I've got one acre you know out here, and I'm just planting these things on these different rows. Okay, because. All right, all right. Because the way you're saying it, it, it seems like there's a lot of moving parts. And so you're saying like every other row is something else, and you want to know like how to how to deal with that in rotation. And so like with the with the many different rows thing, it's like whatever was growing on that row, um, that's that unique plot, right? So. You're growing watermelons there, and you want to know how how much space between the next watermelon row, or is, are you talking about space by time? Well, I, I guess what I'm asking is uh, it, how much space you really need, you know, in order to establish the right environments for that and allow the to allow for real pest management to happen. You know, like if you're um so let's say you're going in the backyard okay okay let's take a backyard and one year you've got watermelons on one corner of the yard and the next next year you want to have the watermelons in a different corner corner of the yard something like that right okay right so to me that's not enough space okay because like even though the watermelons were grown in that one corner the pests of that watermelon are going to be like like cucumber beetles. Cucumber beetles are going to be everywhere in that yard, and they're going to get in the soil, and they're going to overwinter, and all that all that mess that cucumber beetles do. So that's not really big enough. You don't want to separate it by distance so much as you want to separate it by time. Time is the important factor. So you grew watermelons this year. 
don't grow watermelons next year. If you just really have that much pest pressure or whatever, don't grow watermelons every year. You want to you wanna hold off and, and um, grow something completely different that the cucumber beetles don't get on. Mm-hmm. So it's not a question of distance. It's a question of time. Time is the important thing. This this is great. This that's exactly what I was trying to get to. Uh, it is basically, you know, if if you if you do this over here and over here, you're not gonna, and you're just, you're not going to solve. You're not going to answer the problem, right? You know, right, you're right. you're only only going to exacerbate it. You'll just have those beetles move a little further, <laughs> right? right <laughs> they're, because- they're just going to move over here. They're still going to be able to access it. There's not. They're not going to die off. They're still going to be there. Yeah. So you want them. You want to grow something completely antagonistic to the beetles the next year. Something they don't feed on, won't feed on, um, something like that. Yeah. So maybe those beetles, they'll either just die off or they'll just go away. They'll go away. They'll leave and they'll look for something yeah. else, some other prey. And then, gotcha. the, the, When you next grow watermelons, you also incru- include the the farmscaping plants to attract the pests of the watermelon and you also grow the companion plants that repel the pests of the watermelon this you know this is what i was getting at i I was not asking that question very well because um (laughs) it's 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 really a hard thing to to get your mind around sometimes when you're not used to that but literally looking at an example of a farm where they've got you know a whole bunch of rows with you now they like have three rows of one thing and then three rows of another and another thing and they might be trying to grow 15 different things out there on an acre mm-hmm. that are just all all rows um but in that sense and there's no intercropping or anything like that it, it doesn't seem like they are it seems like there's not enough proactive management right. in something like that. And, and they're going to be introducing disease and they're going to be introducing pests and, and, and weed issues um, over time that have become more difficult to manage. But that just goes back to that whole crop selection thing. Pick the crops that are not going to be susceptible to whatever's going on out there. That's not the thing that is driving people in their no. uh, in, in the way they're approaching uh, a lot of people in the way they're approaching their farming. Yeah, right not now. not yet, not yet. Um, but hopefully, we can get we can get people to adopt more agroecological um, understandings while they're while they're planting. You know, get a feel for your land, get a feel for what crops can grow there. Um, you know, I've I've met uh, I've met folks. You know, and they were, they were struggling growing vegetables, but they had like all these blackberry plants growing all over the place. But they just looked at those as weeds. Mm. That's not a weed. That's that's the land telling you, hey, grow some blackberries here, plant blackberries because that's that's what really flourishes here. Right, and, and maybe other things in the family. Yeah, and then. You know, I, I made that suggestion, and some years later, they were really happy that they were planting uh, blackberries and making money off of them. Well, Justin, this is—I um, appreciate you coming in here and, and and doing this. I I feel like I've learned a lot, you know, in the past two days uh, from the presentation at uh, Piney Woods and the and, and making sure we get that content in here. This is this is really amazing material, and Ooh, I feel like. Thanks. We're really just scratching the surface. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean a lot. Of, all the all the theory stuff is is great, but you've got to get out there and and do the stuff. You got to get your hands dirty, and and do the work. And you know that's that's where true understanding comes comes in. And um, you know, like for me, like like it's so hot in Texas right now that I don't grow a lot of the normal crops anymore. Like especially over the summertime, I grow cassava. I'm growing cassava now. Really? Because cassava grows for me. It can take all that heat and, you know, it's it's a great crop for where I'm at. Wow. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you do what it lets you do. You yeah. don't fight it. You yeah. work with it. All right. Well, that's a, I guess that's a wrap for today. Really appreciate it. Well, cool. 